Hi, I'm Othias, and this is actually our most requested video. Well, second most requested video of all time, but we've already done two videos on the most requested, so you guys can just calm down about that. Now, some of you are thinking, oh, it must be the 1903, or the 1911, or it must be um, the Mos and the Gone, or things like that. No, uh, the most requested video after The Gun That Shall Not Be Named was actually a video describing how we do our videos. So, to that effect, this is the Frommer Stop, and this is the Remington Model 10 trench gun. Now, these two guns are currently, as the time I'm recording this, perhaps not by the time you see it, they're currently in production. Now, that means... We have all the information, we have all the ammo, we have everything stacked into one place, and we can actually develop these shows. And we develop two at a time, because that allows us to save on the time cost of setting up and tearing down equipment. So uh, I'll prep two scripts, sit down like I am now with the camera like I am here, and you can imagine what might be happening after I'm done filming this. Uh, we set up the room, we set up the lights, and then we go ahead and film out two. I'll change shirts and stuff so that it stands out a little bit more. Sorry, guys. Sneaky sneak. Uh, when we do episodes that are sort of in series, I go ahead and leave the gear on. Like, I, I don't change clothes because then that kind of lets you know that they're supposed to be in a line. Um, I don't know if anybody's caught on to that. Maybe I'm just overthinking it. Like, in, anyway. Uh, we run two at a time. That's the short answer. It's the only way to really get it done because if we did one at a time, the, uh, the cost of setting everything up would slow everything so far down that we would never get even a day ahead in production. And we have to get as many days ahead as we can in production because often we run into little things that snag us and then we end up stuck back by a week at a time. So for as much as headway as I've ever made, we've always lost it right away. And I'm constantly terrified that we're going to actually miss an episode. Although it hasn't happened yet, and I'm not about to let it happen easily. Call the authorities if there's not an episode on time. Anyway, uh, this episode would have been episode 51, but we're stopping to sort of make a little celebration and to sort of save a little time to make sure that we don't run into that problem. Because we're taking three, four days off to go to Atlanta. Now, by the time this episode airs, that's already happened. So for those of you who met us there, hi, again. Uh, I hope I wasn't too smelly or offensive. Now... Honestly, May's the bigger problem. I think we all know that. As a matter of fact, there might already be, like, some sort of horrible newspaper article about her that... Okay, thank you, May. So, um, this episode's going to give us a little bit of a buffer. Let's give you guys some background on what we're doing. And then episode 51 will be two weeks from now. So, have no fear. Uh, your regular, regularly scheduled programming will be back. Now, before we get to these guns... We first have to know what we're going to film. Now, a large part of this show has been pre-planning. There is no one book that contains every gun that was in World War I. Not yet. By the time we're done with this show, though, I think I might be able to pull it off. And you would not believe some of the obscure or unusual stuff that made it in that battlefield. And there's a number of guns that I think some of you are quite sure were there that were not. I mean... Mm -mm. So, we have to go through and find every claim of any gun that ever was involved in the war. And believe me, every gun manufactured before 1950 has claimed to be in the war. Thankfully, some of those dates just chopped that right out. But uh, after that, we actually have to sometimes buy whole stacks of books about a particular gun just to find out it wasn't there. And then there's other things, like recently we found out that the Craig, the Craig rifle was there... But man, we had to do some digging to actually prove it. So a lot of this show is prep because we don't want to mislead anybody. And I guarantee you some of the information in these episodes has been wrong simply by the fact that it's the best information available in the entire community. Communities aren't perfect. Information is not perfect. It has not been preserved perfectly. But we're going to give it our best shot and hopefully the show will hold out for a good long while until more information surfaces. And then honestly, I wouldn't mind revisiting episodes if whole new things have been discovered. That'd be great. So... We do our best by you, and we do that by gathering a massive list and then stacking out what guns we want for the show. I have this giant spreadsheet. It's beautiful, and it's got all these guns, and whether or not we have seen them or haven't seen them or done the episode or not, what kind of ammo they're going to use, whether or not that's easily accessible. It talks about whether or not we've seen them in certain museum collections that may or may not let us shoot them. It talks about whether or not certain collectors have them that we may or may not borrow. It's everything that we know 
is basically stuck in one place, short of actual research information, on whether or not we can find these things and how we can use them and how much depth we can go into. And that's super important to us because I'd say it represents at least 15% of my total week's work. I mean, it's a lot to stay on top of what is the most current information on the surface layer of these guns. Not even deep research, just tracking what's known and what's turned up recently and going through archives and things like that. Now, despite my growing collection of books, a lot of this front-end research comes from online. I work through a number of forums uh, in a number of languages, actually, but a lot of you guys make your home of our gun boards, let's be fair. In addition, though, I have things like Facebook and other social media accounts so that I can keep in track with other collectors because this opens up three very important factors. One, these guys do their own research, and so the information can be available right away raw because they're willing to share it. That has been stupendous, and I've actually made a lot of friends this way. Number two, they have the guns themselves and often lend them to the show, which is absolutely important because there's no way we could afford to just buy our way through World War I, even with all of our patron support. So number three is weirdly more important than the other two in some regards, but it doesn't come through as clearly on camera. And it's actually where most of our money tends to go, which is that these gentlemen are able to provide us with where they found the information that they did find. And so we can go back and probe that information and then probe the information that led to that information. And so we spend a lot of our money just plain old buying books. All right, so we get a lot of help from the public. We get a help from collectors who are willing to share information and potentially firearms. And we get a help from you guys who might be patrons we also have to maintain that. Now, towards the end of this, we're gonna talk about actually responding to questions and things like that. That's obviously important. But on the front end, we can't just be responding to you guys responding to us. Uh, I feel it's important that I remain a participant in the community regardless of whether or not it's exclusively about the show. So uh, I tend to maintain a lot of contact with curators who I've met, collectors who I've met, and I try to be as open door as I can with talking to everybody because every possible piece of information is important. And some of the things that I have heard that I just did not believe at first, eventually somebody comes back around with hard proof or maybe hard proof the other way and then I feel confirmed and then hooray me. So really, I have to be accessible and I have to be sort of neutral. And that also means that I have to be responsible. So if somebody sends me their gun, I have to make sure that it's insured and shipped safely, that we cover the cost of that insurance using our budget, that we cover the cost of shipping whenever possible out of our budget. Some people are more generous and just send things and I appreciate it, but we try to make it as low impact on the owner as possible. And at the beginning of the show, when we didn't know what we were doing, sometimes we sat on things too long. And now, well, we're able to move them a little quicker and plan them in a little bit better. And I probably have about 20 offers in my inbox, all sorted and separated. And if you'd like to offer something, by all means, we'll stick you in the folder so that I can search for it later. But what we do is we make a mental note. Well, actually, we make a list note that that is available. And then we make sure that we have everything in place for it before we go ahead and pull it out of your hands. Now, this doesn't seem like a big deal, but... It counts for a lot. It counts for basically everything because that's what makes sure that people will continue to support the show with their actual property. And whenever possible, I like to try to thank people that help us with the research very publicly because, again, I, I couldn't have done it without their help. And I want to make sure that everybody else that has something that they might be able to offer knows that we will absolutely acknowledge it and that we're not looking to sort of just like scurry away with it and then share it with everybody else and sort of give them the finger. We want to make sure that we show our appreciation to the people that support this effort because, yes, it's nice that the show is moving on, but I'm going to tell you my number one focus on all this is just trying to get all the way through the World War I firearms. I'm in love with the project itself, and even if the show collapses, on a personal level, I'm not going to give up on getting everything documented into one place. It's just too fun. Once CNR gets a gun, they bring it here for a safety checkout to uh, make sure that it'll function right and see if there's any little bits missing off of it. There are always bits missing off of it. So once we get, once I get it in here, look at, for instance, this 10 Alpha trench gun. I'd never actually physically held one of these. So there's a little bit of research on my part just to spool up to know what I'm getting into. 
Then we've got to order parts if we need any. I've got to schedule manpower, get the bench set up, and then be ready for all of the filming that's going to happen with it. But um, after we're all done with that, then we can actually work on the gun. We've talked about picking all the guns. We've talked about having that sort of social capital to be able to track them down and share them. And if you hear any odd grunting or heavy breathing, they have two large dogs and they cannot be kept out of the living room. Anyway, uh, now's the time to do some hard research on our specific guns. And for that, I generally start at my small personal library. Now, this is a section of it. Uh, we also have a bunch of binders and storage with magazines in all different languages. I find that a lot of the European magazines go into different details or find different things fascinating from the old US magazines. So, I don't know, it's just fun to have a big selection. So, you know, like a big collection of DWJs, that's great. Now, in addition to that, I also have gone ahead and bought up large quantities of PDFs of old French magazines and things like that. I also have uh, books on PDF. Uh, if it's gone into public domain and has been scanned by one of like the Google projects, I go ahead and gather those up. So we have a physical library and a digital one. And then, of course, again, being able to talk to other collectors and gather resources that way. But for the most part, I still favor just grabbing a hold of some of these books, like in this case, our power player is going to come back in, and I recommend everybody who cares about First World War, Austro-Hungarian arms, buys this thing. Uh, I've had people ask me for a link. The problem is every time I pick one, it tends to go away because it gets distributed elsewhere, done differently. You might just have to do some digging. Look in the description for the title. Do a quick Google search. I promise it's worth your time. However, it is in German. And so that's going to lead us to another member of our team who is never really seen. All right, Jokers, this is as close as you're ever going to get to getting me on camera. Hello. I like you all just fine over there. But this is Susie, and I do a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to the translation. So don't get excited. I'm not fluent in anything. But what I do is I photograph the pages from the books painstakingly, one page at a time. And I upload them into the computer and then run them through an OCR software, at which point I dump them into good old Google Translate. Get a super rough translation and then kind of see if I can work out the details and then hopefully we pass it on to some native speakers to help us clear up any of the tricky bits. Now this part of the show is usually at about four in the morning, uh, maybe to five is usually when I give up, but I tend to do most of my reading and note taking very late at night or if I have the occasion earlier in the morning although there's usually something that requires me to go somewhere to a nine to five to get something else done during the day. I do this because it leaves me the least likely chance of being interrupted because I get a lot of emails, text messages and things like that and I can hide my phone but then as we all know you get paranoid that there's some emergency somewhere. Right now at this time of the night I know that all my loved ones are tucked into bed and I can sit here and focus. So what I'm gonna do is take any of Susie's translation notes. I'm going to take any of the original material that I have here. I'm gonna go back and check on any images or diagrams, things like that. Um, if I have patents handy, I'll check them in physical book form or I'll check them online in the digital form that I have. Um, a lot of those patents actually are now coming from our friend Matthew Sessions, who we are actually using some of our patron funds to support his efforts to do some real deep diving into those European archives. Uh, it's a beautiful project and we're just helping him pay that cost so that we can reap the benefit. He's not taking a check. Wonderful man. Now, uh, anyway, I gather all of this into a single big list that's formed around each individual gun and I just drop in everything, even the stuff that doesn't seem all that sensible or all that realistic. Um, if I have my doubts, it all goes in there because what I'm doing is I'm comparing as many sources as possible and the things that line up that don't seem to have come from the same original uh, biographer or writer, well, it starts to show that it might actually be important. And then go back around, look for corroboration, things like that. But that refinement really happens towards the end of the note taking and the beginning of what is basically script making, which it's kind of an entirely different process because I usually get all these notes done and then take a day or two before going back to the script. So it's had time to percolate. Hi guys, May here. I'm here to talk about my portion of the show. By the way, that one in the front is Tula. The one in the back is Bergman. 
They do absolutely nothing for the show, except looked adorable and fluffy. So, eh, we keep them around anyway, but they're not on payroll. Anyway, CN Arsenal before we actually started the video series was really well known for its articles and for its photography. We basically changed that setup into the videos that you see today, just a little more stretched out and a lot more research is going into them now, which is exciting. And thank you guys for all the support. It's really helping to drive the show. But anyway, for the photography, we are using Lightbox setup. And this guy right here is actually the Mark I. Othias has since this one built several others that are way more robust and sorry, I can't control those two. Um, and just far more sturdy than this guy is. However, this one basically we just leave st in its standing position, just roll out from the corner of the room whenever we need to do it for any odd quick photo we need to take or for situations like this where I'm showing you guys what exactly I do with CN Arsenal behind the scenes. I'm more than just a camera girl. Anyway, why don't we take it over to the light box and show you guys what all I actually do. Okay guys, first things first, we're gonna put in a piece of foam. It basically just helps keep the gun in the same depth of feel when I'm changing sides. So, oh, it would help if I had the foam on the right side. So, one side, take her out, flip her, right side, and then top down. Now for this guy, he's a little bit, um, he's gonna cancel a little bit, so I'll obviously take the camera to the side of the light box and tilt her to kind of get a little more top down on her. And then last but not least, I have to get my super special secret piece of foam that helps with tilts. And basically, simple as that. I'll just aim at the right area, get her at the right tilt angle, whatever it is I need, and boom, take my shot. Okay, let's head over to POVs. All right, we're gonna start out with aligning the focus with the front sight. Basically, you have to raise the camera up above the gun, get a nice good shot of the front sight. And then at that point, we're gonna have to lower the camera in order to align it with the rear sight. And at this point, we're just gonna walk the focus back. I'm gonna try to make sure I get all little bits, including like either bolt handles or safeties or cocking pieces, rear sights. I'm gonna to try to make sure I get all of their focus points as I walk the focus point on the gun back. Now this process entirely from start to finish for getting all the pictures for the gun can take somewhere between 15 minutes to 25 minutes, depending on the difficulty of the gun and the shots I'm trying to take. And not just that, I'm also trying to take multiple shots to make sure I have the pictures that I need. All right, let's go take a look at some editing because that's really where most of this time is gonna come in. Taking things over to Photoshop, we'll pile in our best photos and start the real work. First, some general cleanup. And then the tedious bit. <laughs> the magic wand never gets it all, and we can dial the light box in all we want, Eventually it wears and we're back to manually cutting the guns out. So basically, we trace every inch. After that, we can ditch the background. To get the best image, we'll also trace out all the wood or brass, so we can tweak the color values independently. From here, it's just adjust to taste, and we're out. Generally, it takes about 45 minutes to an hour to do a good detailed preparation on one of these sets. All the while, I'm still at work, this time converting those notes into a script, sort of. While I don't read from a prompter, I tend to sort into 5-10 to 10 minute maximum stretches so my dumb brain gets all the facts straight. I break these up and keep you all from going blind with boredom by working in relevant visuals. 
These include our own images, like May was working on, and when we come up short, our friend Joel over at Rock Island Auction has been helping out by providing use of their back catalog. All for free, and all for your benefit. Seriously, thank you RIA. Additionally, we'll include relevant patents and historical photos. On the patent front, we're actually funding the ordering costs for Matt to do some archive digging in Europe, trying to get deeper in for every episode. As for historical images and footage, I've been doing a lot of deep archive digging, often going page by page through huge sites. I gather them up and label them so that I can find them later. By the way, some people have sent in photos of rare rifles or especially pistols in use. We always appreciate that. All of this must happen as I am scripting. I cannot hit record unless I know material is available, so I tend to do these searches as I am doing the scripting from the notes, making this a whole day or multi-day process. I'm Jay. Uh, I don't normally get on camera, but this is what I do. Make these old guns shoot. I do all the reloading. Okay, today we'll be reloading brass shotgun shells for the Remington Model 10. In doing this reloading, I have to work alongside the same pace as Ophias does in his research on guns because I have to get this ammo ready to be taken to the range ahead of the filming. And tracking him down and following him is annoying because he doesn't communicate very well. Most of the stuff we do, we can, we can rarely find commercially made off the shelf ammo so we have to make it. That involves me talking to Drake to get historical data and doing research my own and cross-referencing various books and load charts to get to as close to original data as I can. Sometimes we have to fabricate cartridges, which I will bring Mark in to help if I can't do it on my own. By the time we're done with this series, we will be making custom dies for some of the rarer guns we are tracking down. All right, we're on the range, and I'm yelling because he's got the mic, but he's the man we want to listen to. This is Dave. Uh, previously, we had filmed with Shoot Logic, and they're a little bit further out, and we were having some light trouble. Right now, Dave was setting up his own range, and he had the opportunity to allow us to sort of pick some of our resources out here. So uh, before we can even film CNR Soul, we do have to have access to somewhere to actually set up and shoot. I can't just do it in my backyard. I feel like my neighbors would get just a little bit irritated, although this is the South. And it's probably illegal. Well, who's worried about illegal out of two of us? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I just want to give Dave a chance to talk about some of the work that we've been doing out here just so that we can support the show. Now, mind you, he has other interests out here as well, but still, this is an impressive little setup and we've just started to get the grass to grow. Well, guys, uh, we love having CNR Arsenal out here. Uh, I got linked up with Athias through a mutual friend, and I was putting this range together uh, just for, for uh, private use. Uh, and what we've been able to do is put something together that has been they've been able to use effectively no matter what they're trying to shoot. Uh, we've used the design of the range to make use of the light uh, for, through different type, times of the day. We have a backstop directly behind us, and we also created one to your left, my right, which allows them to shift whether they want to shoot uh, for long shots, shorter shots, and whether the light has shifted throughout the day. And it allows me use of two different berms depending on different things I want to use as well. So we've been able to come up with something that is really mutual, uh, mutually beneficial uh, for all of us. And you know, we've been able to, to really enjoy having them out here. Yeah, we appreciate it a lot. And then I guess next up in this segment, because I'm piecing this out together over the course of two weeks, you're going to see us actually using this facility. What you doing? Uh, we're unpacking the car. Hold okay. on. Ugh. We've got some plans beyond the regular filming today. Jay, will you give me a hand? Right now, I have to haul this equipment into what are temporarily woods, because we are on the main rifle range, but there's also going to be some pistol bays over here. And because we're trying to give people a better product, we gotta pay attention to the sun. And at this point in the morning, it's gonna be over there for a little while, which means if we're doing right-handed rifle slash shotgun shooting, we need to put it on our right side. And the only way to do that is to get down in here and shoot into the back side of this horizontal berm to get you guys the product you want. Now, luckily, we only need 50 yards to get this done. So we're just gonna untie this bag and get to work. What are you doing? Uh, opening up the equipment, packing out the tripods. Uh, we got a lot of stuff that needs 
popping up, so we'll just keep it this for a few minutes and then we'll start pulling gear out. That's, a That's the best thing about spare parts. Working on. Hmm? Oh, so I'm unpacking the camera bag. Got four cameras, some lenses, of course, to go on them. Um, we've got the monitors, high speed camera, bunch of cords and cables that, of course, go with everything. Basically, just putting everything together right now. So now what are you working on? I am pre-positioning the cameras. They are not really where they belong just yet, but it's close enough to sort of get things rolling. And I'm also making sure that they're all sort of unified in their settings. Um, we run four cameras usually, but we've changed locations recently. And as part of that, we can only run three. We used to have an overhead wall that we could work with. Um, we're looking to build a contraption to help us out with that, but for the moment, the only thing we have is our old jib that we had set up out of scrap stuff for the first couple episodes and then decided that it was too much setup. Well, now what we're having to do is we basically film with three for full mag and then we turn around and set up the overhead and run a half mag or a little more to go ahead and get those overhead shots. So technically we're lying on the overhead shots just for the immediate vicinity. Um, pretty soon we'll have everything adapted to the way that we can just do a nice big take and it's all unified and honestly it's easier on editing anyway. What you working on? Uh, I'm getting the last little bit of this set up. Uh, Bruno's bringing me the cables. Uh, the way we're set, we've got three cameras on May, like I said before. And then um, this is our temporary jib, and we'll just switch one of the cameras back over to the jib. We have four, we usually run four, but sometimes it's easier just to swap the camera because I now have to chase cards all day. Thank you, Bruno. And then we use uh, basically a three tier microphone system. So we've got a decent ambient there. And then we got two shotguns set up that are picking up sort of the mid-range. And then we just have kind of a simple Zoom H1 that's grabbing the very top end of sound. This mic's dialed into very, very low sensitivity. Uh, it's just catching the top, and then those guys are catching the middle, which is where the big sound is anyway, so we got the best mics on it. And then this guy's catching sort of the more sensitive end. And then actually, I shouldn't say three layer, because May's going to be carrying a lav, and that's going to pick up all the little tiny clicks and handling noises. And then the minute the gun goes off, it's just going to get blown out. So... We stitch all that together in post to make sure that we get the full sound of what's going on um, because the equipment can't adjust as easily as the human ear can, well, to a point. Give me just the load two in the mag and let's just get two shots out for what we're doing for audio. Not picking it up? No, you gotta pump it back hard. There we go. Safety forward. Huh? Yeah, push the safety forward. Dump it in the ground. Hey, give me another one. coming out. Loading segment. I know this looks like shit, but the cloud's on its way. She crunchles. No, no, we're just doing it from here, and then she's gonna lift up the gun. Right. She won't fire. It's about to hit. I'll give you the okay. Hold on. Recording overhead, recording overhead. Oh, now we're gonna move into a cloud. There's two in the tube. Thank you. You can probably do it before the light goes. How much walk did we get? A little bit. It came forward about like a little more than that. It was like up to there. You could probably see it on the camera though. Yeah, probably. I hate to see it. What you doing? I'm standing in the muck trying to figure out how to get a shot of 
hitting one of these in the middle of the air. So we'll sort it out in a moment, but I'm, let me get back to it. Okay. Looking for pieces of the ruined grenade. In the wild. <laughs> a wild J appeared. What's she doing? I'm uh, fixing the hole. <laughs> and the grenade rain gets in. That <laughs> where, stops my mind. Where a pellet just went through it. So we can shoot it again. Seems kind of ghetto. Also, Dave got thrown. He's very pleased with himself. Do it more batter. I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> What's going on here? Don't. Oh. I want to see what the jam was like. All right, go for it. So at this point, I'm just cooling off from the heat. Uh, to recap the day, we. Had some problems with the handguard on the Remington 10, so that's going back to the shop for some more work. We're pretty sure we know why. Um, as a matter of fact, in the middle of filming this, I went to the shop and came back out trying to get some extra wood rasp on it, and I just couldn't get it right. So uh, that's going to have a holder set up. We did go ahead and record the Fromer, though. We had time for that, although all hands on deck, so not as much recording behind the scenes. And we managed to get uh, the grenade tosses for the Remington 10. You guys probably don't know what that means, but don't worry about it. Uh, it'll be cool. And then, so that means I now have to kind of reschedule and decide which one's going first, uh, because Bruno has to have time to do his thing. And that means that the former is going first because we do not have all the footage we need for the Remington, and we're not guaranteed it. And we can't come back out and film until after we get through this NRA show event that has already happened by the time you're watching this. Um, and then honestly, that's a big part of the show. Like the, the biggest part of the show is just being adaptive and flexible and then trying and trying and trying again because stuff just doesn't always work right the first time around. There's always some weird little issue. <sighs> With the outdoor stuff finally covered, it's time to film inside. I work loosely from the script with plenty of fumbling. Goodbye! Is that missing? No, we're supposed to be leading into a Zoom, so I'm not sure. Oh, Obviously, this can take quite a while to film something like a one hour episode. And then I can go ahead and set up that camera if you want, or we can do it as a, a separate take. Uh, that one's up to you because there is a lot of this. Rigid, weather. No, it's, it's not that bad. No. no. I got it. Yeah, we can do a, you can do a lead in. Yeah. And then the lead out would be 1911, 1912 catalog. Yeah, okay. I think I can run a triple on this, believe it or not. I believe in you. We'll find out. Check your fingers. I'll give it a shot. Yeah, that one's still recording. Can I hit this one? No, I think I can burn it. Alright, this is a. Uh, it's Dev, Dev 3. three. It's still part of Dev yep. 3 zooming in now. It's kind of an auto relax. Alright, let me make sure this is running. Check one, two. Yep, okay. <sighs> May does not work from a script, but we didn't have any hands to film that. This design was exactly what Remington needed, and so they bought it up. Now All right, so we're back on the range, and uh, there's not a lot of footage of this day because it's a productive day. But uh, right now we're just going to do some high-speed footage, and then we're wrapped out for the day. Honestly, May's sick, I'm sick. We're just going to get out of the sun as soon as we can. Okay. That's it. So get her full. Ready? Yeah. One, two, three, go! I got it. I'm gonna her out. With the raw material in hand, it's time to start refining. 
Many of our featured images are fairly standardized, so I have developed a number of templates, like the light box data or portraits. For ammo, I take the information that Drake researches up for me, thanks Drake, it's a huge time saver, and plug it into this spreadsheet I prepared. That gives me what I need to scale the image in Photoshop and set the markers for the bar graph animations, which I can then render out. I used to do the animation work, but it was well, time-consuming to the point of insanity. Also, while the 2D looked neat, it was inflexible. I still do some light 2D animation for certain concepts, but mostly it's all Bruno now. Yay. Okay, man. So look at the camera. This, is my, this is why I like to be behind the camera. Uh, hi, I'm Bruno. I'm the, uh, the animator on, uh, on Primer. Um, I contacted Athias after he made a joke during the Lewis Gun episode about uh, being stuck with his hokey 2D stuff. And uh, I started thinking, well, why can't I do that? Because that's what I went to school for. So I got in touch with him and um, sort of spun off from there. Uh, the first one I first animation I did was for the uh, the rolling block, and ever since then I've been animating each episode's gun uh, to make a three D animation to show the internals and stuff. So I guess we can see kind of what I do here. Um, basically, each week. Uh, <laughs> Othias drops off a gun with me and I had to pull it apart and use gloves because apparently my hands are very uh, damaging to the surfaces. So um, yeah, I pull the gun apart, I figure out how it works, I figure out what all the pieces are, how many springs, how many trigger bars, triggers, pins, disconnectors, that sort of thing, and then I have to make all of them one by one. I usually try and measure them so that they're the right size, and then I have to put it all together and make it move convincingly. So. Let's see how that works. Okay, so so this is the latest one I've been working on. It's from or stop. Uh, one thing I've learned is I'm not a fan of long recoil. This thing is really weird. Um, but yeah, basically each of these parts I've made from the, uh, the original Elas Alpha Me, I measured them all, and they're mostly uh, accurate. Sometimes I have to fudge things a bit so they fit, but um, yeah, you have everything. You have your hammer, sear, barrel, the bolt, the bolt carrier, uh, the dual springs on this thing, trigger, etc. And right now I have, um, I think I just finished, yeah, I basically have uh, the first round being fed. So you grip the gun and pull the thing back, load first round, and then I already have it firing, so the bullet goes out. And I just, and right now I'm in the middle of um, pulling all these things back because it's of long recoil so the whole thing like shoots out of the back of the gun and then this is going to go forward so uh yeah i guess i'll drag this over because it's not on screen yeah so this is the uh, the hierarchy list this is everything that makes up the gun is in this list and i have to i label everything so i know where it is and then it's just a matter of going through this timeline and picking um the right components so right now for example i have this at full travel so everything's compress as far as it'll go, and the next thing is the barrel will go forwards. So I grab this, and I also have to grab, uh, where is it, the, the retainer, because these are all connected together. And I go here, and then I sort of have to think to my head in my head, like, how long is this going to take, you know, time-wise? I don't want it to be, uh, obviously, the slower you do it, the easier it is to see, but that means the longer the animation is, which means it ends up taking longer to render in the end. So it's this constant battle between like slowing things down enough that people can see and figure out what's going on, but not so long that I end up spending like half a day rendering everything, doing a bit of math to splitting it. So we'll do half a second and we can reset this back to zero. Well, one of these back to zero. <laughs> Why is this not doing that? Oh, right, because I have it set. That's why. So this should be, I grabbed the wrong thing in the hierarchy. So now that I have it where I want it, I hit S to um, sort of cement the keyframe change. I have to go back and do that for the other thing. And now, if we scrub through here, we have this thing going back, and then this part goes forward. So that's done, but now I have to make sure to go back and grab the main recoil spring, that thing. And this also needs to reset. So it's, it's basically sort of a checklist going each time, like, like what's happening right now? Oops. Not that much. Uh, what do I have it set to? 0.625. So I can copy previous keyframes and drop them in here. Whoop. 
so yeah, basically it's it's a matter of breaking down each action of the gun and and remembering which parts move when and how quickly they have to move so it all sort of syncs up together. I also keep a, a list for myself, sort of, it'll go over, um, of basically all the, uh, I have basically the notes for when things happen. So usually what I do is I, I hand animate, if you will, the, the first cycle of the gun. And then I basically just select all the pieces and I copy paste the keyframes each time because obviously the cycle is the same each time. So I don't have to do it every single time. It saves a lot of time that way. Same thing for the, um, the first round, for example. The first round is animated. And after that, basically what happens is I have each round go up and sit where the first round was. And then it basically hides itself like one frame before the cycle repeats. So really it's just the first round going over and over again. But since it's an identical cycle, matches up nicely um, but yeah this is basically you know it's a lot of sort of time-consuming step-by-step things and I usually have to you know uh, pass it by a thighs a few times because usually I miss things or, or something wobbles that I didn't you know when you when you work on this stuff for too long and there's so many pieces sometimes you forget to move a thing even if, especially if it's a very slight movement so I'll have to go back and uh, sort of double check things, make sure everything's right. And so it's a lot of back and forth. It's a very iterative process. Uh, and once we both take a look at it and say, yep, that looks good. And then I basically start the quote unquote full sort of pre-render that can take, I mean, it depends how long the animation is, but you figure for like 45 seconds or to a minute long animation, which is what these usually end up being. And we can look at anything from like eight to 10 hours or more uh, of just letting the computer process everything and make sure it looks right. And then I just pass it off to him and he stitches it together into the episode. So that's kind of how the whole thing goes. Hey, Bruno, did you want to uh, retell the story of me asking you to do the rolling block? And <laughs> like yeah, it seems to be a laugh out of people. Uh, so when I, yeah, when I contacted uh, Athias the first time, um, yeah, basically, yeah, I didn't know it, but at the time he was working up to do the, uh, the rolling block, the French rolling block in 8mm Lavelle. And I was, uh, I was at that point, I uh, was it like August of last year or something like that. So I'd been like, oh gosh, like four or five months after graduation. I was kind of, in a, I was sort of in a bit of like a post-graduating funk, I guess. And I, I just kind of wanted to do something. So I sort of, I don't know why in retrospect, I assumed naively that a lot of people had already probably asked him for, <laughs> for, uh, this job. So I was like, yeah, fuck it. I'll, you know, I'll send it, I'll send an email out and see what happens. But uh, he got back to me really quick, which was already like, you know, check one because I'd been sending emails out to like the black void of HR departments for months and nothing ever got back to me. So he almost, honestly, he already kind of won me over right there, but whatever. I was like, hey, you know, like I sent him some stuff I did and uh, I was like, hey, you know, like, could we do like a test run? Like, what do you need me to do? And, and he was like, can you do a, a rolling block in 8mm Labelle? And I did the classic like... I don't know, like intern bullshit thing where I was like, yeah, of course I could do that. <laughs> I just shot it off. And then as soon as I did that, I'm like, what the hell is a rolling block? <laughs> so I was like, shit, I don't know what that is. I had to, I had to Google it. I'm like, oh, that's a rolling block. Yeah, I could do that. Um, and in that point, cue like two weeks of panic, like back and forth. Like, how many springs does this have? And they're all flat springs and I have to animate each one of them. And like, how does this work? And at that, when we first started for like the first few months, he would send me pictures because I wasn't here. So he would like disassemble it and send me pictures and I'd be like, oh, that's great. Can you send me like, it was very arduous to explain like exactly what, cause I would need like some weird angles and stuff like that. So it was a lot of back and forth and he's busy doing other stuff. So he can't always get back to me right away. So I'd be sitting there like trying to figure things out on my own. So luckily I had, I had done a lot of that when I was in school of just like building things off of like blueprints and diagrams. So it wasn't, I wasn't completely hopeless, but you know, it doesn't beat having the, the real thing that I can measure. That was one of the reasons for moving up here was so I could actually like, you know, like grab the gun with me and pull it apart piece by piece, at least as much as I dare. This one was pretty scary because it had a bunch of pins and I hate driving out pins, but. Yeah, and uh, you're slowly making a livable income thanks to yes, this and Anvil's uh, Patreon because yeah. you do all the editing for Anvil. Uh, yeah, I do. I do also do, the, I am the editor for Anvil uh, and that's been, that's been growing ridiculously fast. Um, so yeah, I'm like one of the few people with like a decent paycheck. <laughs> At this point, which actually it's funny, my mom. He's the only one with a paycheck. <laughs> well, it's funny. Uh, coincidentally, uh, today is uh, the one year anniversary from my uh, my graduation. Oh, 
So I think, yeah, technically, I think I fall. I remember like reading like a thing from my school. Where it was like, oh, most people find employment within like a year. And I was like, damn, that's a long ass year. But I guess technically I fall within that window now. So I, yeah, it's been a, it's been a long, it's been, a, it's weird. It feels like an eternity ago, but it hasn't been that long. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's fun working on these things, pulling them apart. It's like a big puzzle. Um, frustrating puzzle sometimes, uh, but it's fun. It's fun when it all I, it sort of clicks, and I feel like I, I almost feel like I can. I don't. I want to say like I can vicariously like see what they're like, what the designer's mind was going through, kind of thing when they were building these things, especially something like this, where it was like, oh no, we need to build a thirty-two ACP pistol, but all the you know good simple mechanisms are patented, so we got to come up with something weird. So you know, cue long action, you know, thirty-two ACP, frommer. Um, I get it. I just want to say to the ghost of Frommer, I get it. I hate you, but I get it. <laughs> Alright, at this point, I have all the pieces processed and numbered, so we get to just lay them in. Then, some minor corrections. Cropping and dropping in all the video and audio transitions. Assembly comes out to roughly four hours, I'd say. But only because of that upfront organization. With the episode presumably ready, I step in and watch the whole thing making notes of any errors or necessary adjustments. There's always something. With May's seal of approval, the show is effectively done. But the work is not. I have to upload it to YouTube, which can take some time, and over to Full30, and whoever else by the time you're watching this. Um, and all those things require getting ahead of the game, letting it process so that you guys can get it at fuller resolution, because I got yelled at a lot when people were discovering that I had made it public, but it was still at 360 or whatever. Anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, I get the show uploaded. I get the thumbnail, uh, custom thumbnail laid in, all the show notes. Make sure we include everything. You guys ask a lot of questions that are already in the description. Uh, we get it all stacked up to best serve people as quickly as possible. And then we shove it out in the public. And then from there, you little goblins start talking. With the video uploaded, the work is not done. Now it's time to list it widely on social media and begin answering comments. In addition, I watch for mentions elsewhere of the project and try to engage people, answer their questions, and gather their impressions of the series. We make the show so people can learn and be entertained, so I want to be responsive to any praise or complaints. Of course, my inbox is also filling up daily. In general, communication with the public at large is probably getting into 40% of my time. It's pretty heavy. All right, so just to recap, sort of, if I can even remember all this at this point, we plan out what we want to film. We find the things that we want to film. We research the things that we want to film. We prep ammo and repairs on the things we want to film, photography and editing. Uh, throughout the show we have other photography and editing. We have our animation of how the thing works so that we can tell you how it works. We take it to the actual range and shoot the thing. We film indoors to talk about all the things that we learned from the previous things. It's a lot of things. Uh, then we upload it. Then all of you guys tell us how you feel about your breakfast and the show. And then uh, we respond to all of that. On top of all this, there's a layer of making sure that we make promises and keep them and move in and out loaners and generally are good people. That should just about cover it. Except for the fact that money makes the world go round. And all of that is, believe it or not, pretty pricey. I mean, we've got transport. Uh, if the crew's out there working, we want to make sure that we feed them. If uh, Because they're volunteers for the most part. I mean... Yeah, we reward Bruno, because Bruno has to work almost as hard as I do to get those animations done. But, realistically, most of it is just, it's Jay's in it, May's in it. They're not taking paychecks, you know what I mean? Susie's not taking a paycheck. So, uh, a lot of the expense is really going to shipping insurance, the odd thing that we can't borrow. A lot of ammunition cost, a lot of parts cost, a lot of uh, transport because some of this money is trying to get sacked away so that we can get to the other side of the nation so that we can do more filming and at some point some of this stuff we might not even be able to find in the US for the book and we're gonna have to go overseas just to photograph it so some of it's trying to get pushed aside to save for certain big things and then some of it's just getting consumed right away to keep the show moving it's an ambitious project so if we had stayed at our funding level of like 2k a month, we'd have probably starved out as we got into this period and had to slow down production and found some other weird magical way to keep you guys busy and reduce the show to once a month because it's gotten pricey. It's gotten really pricey. 
So, a big part of the show is actually fundraising. Now, I'm not going to ask anybody for anything on this episode. I'm just going to explain how it works. Number one, we get almost all of our funds from Patreon because that is where you guys, the viewer, have gone, I like the show, I want to see the next episode, I understand that I don't have to give them a dollar and they will probably be okay, but divide that out over enough people and no, we won't be. So many of you took personal responsibility for the thing that you liked and I can't say how much I really appreciate that. I understand it to my core, what that means and how you guys feel about the show and I honestly don't even know how to internalize that kind of praise. I'm much better at getting called Kermit the Beard. Anyway, wait, May's trying not to laugh at me, just as a fourth wall there. Uh, anyway, we take that cash very seriously. Uh, I honestly don't take a regular paycheck at all. I try to roll it all back into production as much, as much as possible. And in some cases, when we actually do have to buy pieces, we try to sort of hold on to them long enough to share them with the Great War and make sure there's not going to be any problems down the road, and then we can kick them back out and recoup some of the funds. So we are trying to be very responsible with those funds. But let me tell you, the more funds there are, the easier this gets, because sometimes we just forget or we miss a step and we got to get something overnight in quick book here now I messed up it always helps it's amazing so I have to make sure that I manage that as like a human resource because I can't neglect that people are trying to take care of the show I must make sure that I respond to them I must make sure that I appreciate them but I also have to make sure that there's always enough of them every month some patrons leave and that's fine but i have to make sure that more of them come in because without that support the show starts to break down and uh twice a year we also go ahead and do some very proactive fundraising where we work through posters and t-shirts now this has two things that go for it one yes it raises money and yes we need that money uh posters actually on the margins do much better than t-shirts but here's the thing this is part of number two a lot of you guys feel like you own a piece of the show, and I think you do too, and you want to represent that. You want to feel connected to what's going on, and I agree, I want to feel connected to you guys too. So, especially with something like the t-shirts, you get to wear a piece of the comedy, a piece of the experience, you get to be reminded of the thing that you enjoy, and honestly, I like wearing our t-shirts, not just because it's like, ooh, I own this, but because... I appreciate that the project's going on, and honestly, I tend to think of you guys, the supporters and viewers, when I wear my shirt. So, we do that fundraising by as a way of sort of giving something for you guys tangible to hold on to, because once you turn the computer off, the show is off. Uh, and we also do it, quite frankly, so that we can keep making the show, so that we have something in the bank for the budget. Okay. To that regard, we've actually previously had a number of people involved in production of certain things, but we're getting down to just one. One reliable, beautiful man. So, let's see if he has some words for us. Hi, I'm Martin. I pride myself on being the background guy, so this video might be a bit rough. But what do I do? Well, I shoot guns. A lot. I drink beer. A lot. Don't worry, I never mix the two. I come here as the founder of an outfit called SGM, Schneider General Media. Not only am I a massive fan of CN Arsenal, I am honored to be the official printer of Othias's work. My partners and I have decades of experience in manufacturing with a specialty in print and color science. SGM is a network of small businesses that have a pretty straightforward mission. Make sure our families are fed, our clients' families are fed, our guns are fed, and in the case of CN Arsenal, their guns are fed. My shop in particular uses various printing technologies, including solvent, echo solvent, UV, and aqueous. Many of the machines and supporting technologies are developed in-house. More than anything, I am a quality nerd. Everything is calibrated daily, if not multiple times per day. Each machine is adjusted for environmental conditions and wear. What this means is that every print you receive is identical to the one personally approved by Athias, thus making sure his vision is delivered to your doorstop. I have been blessed to be the provider of posters for CN Arsenal, but haven't scratched the surface of things that can be done to help support my favorite channel. Othias, back to you. I would be remiss if I didn't mention our catch-all executive producer. 
Now, our good friend Michael Blackwell has been our number one fan and supporter from the beginning and did a lot to help me organize and plan the show. In addition, he still puts in a lot of effort when it comes to big projects and hard travel. All right, I think that's got us pretty well wrapped up. Uh, I'm sure there's stuff I'm missing. There's always such little details that come up and you would not believe the bizarre emergencies that you can get into producing something like this. But, for most part, you guys at least now know why my blood pressure is where it's at. Now, uh, with that said, my only final message for this is that I want to thank each and every one of you. Whether you're just plain watching, or whether you've taken the time to comment, which is like a step up, or if you've taken the time to share the show, or if you've taken the time to support the show financially, or if you just came in for one video because you happen to own the gun and you want to know a little bit more about it, if you enjoyed the experience, if you feel like you are a little bit more connected to the history of small arms because of watching this, then I feel satisfied. And I'm glad you're here. Thank you all. Maze of butt. Hmm, 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 hmm.